have uh, three uh, distinguished speakers. They are coming from a wide range of research expertise. So we'll have uh, 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 information on emerging market banking, uh, information on financial inclusion global indicators, uh, which will be the first um, talk by uh, Leo uh, Klopper. She's a lead economist at, at, at the World Bank uh, in the Development Research Group. And then uh, we have uh, Stein Klassons, uh, who will be uh, talking about uh, foreign banking. So uh, it is a privilege for me to introduce the Lior uh, Pussy. Um, as I <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and so it's actually set up very nicely by our executive director from the U.S. Um, who mentioned some of the data which I'll be discussing today. Um, so to jump right in, um, I will be presenting the results from a, re a recent large project, very ambitious project, to collect comparable data around the world on the use of financial products. Um, so this is, uh, the project was funded by a 10-year grant from the Gates Foundation with the realization that as there's increasing awareness by the G20 and other organizations, Financial inclusion is important to help the poor save and to invest and to manage their day-to-day -day finances. We had no indicators or benchmarks of how people actually use financial services around the world. So as I mentioned, the goal of this project is to measure in a consistent manner data over a large number of countries. We also are interested in identifying the market segments that are most excluded, women, youth, the poor. And these, uh, this data has been very useful in motivating policymakers as well as practitioners to introduce new products. Um, and so th we designed a questionnaire. Um, the design of the project uh, was that we added uh, Gallup, the pollsters, have a World Poll Survey that they've been collecting data in over 150 countries around the world since 2005. And what we do is we added on a module to this pre-existing questionnaire. And so again, this question, why do we care about financial inclusion, which is a finding as the use of formal financial services, there's growing evidence that financial inclusion has significant welfare benefits. Um, for example, some very nice research in Kenya has showed that offering women access to savings products has an, increases household consumption of health care and education. And as I mentioned, policymakers are increasingly aware of the importance of financial inclusion. In last weekend's G20 meetings, the communique explicitly stated the financial inclusion broadening um, access to formal financial services should be a priority of the G20 countries and beyond. And so by our definition, who are the included, those that use financial services, who are the excluded? Well, certainly there's a segment of the population we'll call the voluntarily excluded. These are people who simply don't have enough money or desire to use a formal account. However, there's also the involuntary excluded. Those are excluded because of market frictions, because they're too far from the closest bank, it's too costly or difficult for them to reach it, because banking, available banking services are too expensive or complicated, et cetera. And so where there is a role for policy and for private sector initiatives is to help bridge this gap and to bring some of those voluntarily excluded into the formal financial sector. And so here are the numbers which were recently mentioned in the previous presentation. We find that about 2.5 billion adults around the world are unbanked, about 1.3 billion of whom are women. Um, we find 40, about 40% 40 of the unbanked in developing economies compared to over 90% of adults in most high-income economies. As I mentioned, I'll speak about a little bit a few slides, we find persistent gender gaps, about 37% of women relative to 46% of men. And we find particularly high rates of exclusion among those um, who, are, who are living under the poverty line. And so the figure on your left here again for splice by high income versus developing economies shows the use of financial uh, use of accounts, ownership of accounts by indiv some individual characteristics. Women, youth, the poor, rural residents are the most financially excluded. We find in developing economies those in the poorest 20% of earners are less than half as likely to have an account as those in the highest income quintile. The figure on your right shows that in high income economies we really don't see much of a gender gap anymore. However, in developing economies, even after controlling for other for individual characteristics, we still see a persistent nine percentage point gap among, between genders, even among the richest 20% of earners. 
Um, we also collect data on the frequency of use and modes of access. So for example, in the figure on your left shows that in high income economies, most of us use our debit card or ATM card on a regular basis. Whereas in developing economies, on average, people, more than half of the adults use their accounts exactly one to two times a month, which is suggestive that these are being used purely for transactional purposes, to withdraw money deposited by an employer or the government, and not for financial purposes. So we also ask questions on why do you use your account? And so specifically, we look at the use of accounts uh, by, to receive wages, remittances, um, and government payments. It's, it, quite interestingly, this is a very popular policy initiative these days. Um, USAID, Gates, et cetera, recently set up this Better Than Cash Alliance, whose goal is actually, whose goal is to encourage the use of electronic government payments of both wages and transfers in order to expand financial inclusion. And so we do see that about a quarter of account holders in LAC, for example, are using their accounts to receive governments from the, uh, payments from the government. Um, important caveat here is, for example, Mexico established such a program. However, in that case, um, recipients were required to withdraw the full amount from their account. And so uh, you know, here, I think, as a policy perspective, it's important at the design stage to make sure that these are accounts that can be actually used for financial transactions, be used to save and for formal payments. Um, we find over 60% of adults in ECA, in, um, Eastern, uh, in Europe and Central Asia, using their accounts to receive wages. Um, and about 40% of adults in Sub-Saharan Africa using their accounts to receive remittances. And suggestive evidence is that many people in Africa actually open their bank account in order to receive these formal payments in a safer, um, often less costly manner. And so quite importantly and quite novel, we actually ask the unbanked, why don't you have an account? And so here are some broad categories which we also use later for research. Um, so we find that by far the most common reason given as the only reason by over 30% of adults is I don't have enough money. However, we also find that it may be the case that if financial services were more accessible or less costly to use, people may not, um, that reporting that you don't have enough money to use an account is very much related to the local costs of banking. Um, next, about a quarter of adults say it's too expensive. That's the most common uh, response given in Latin America, where over 40% of respondents say that their banking services are too expensive. Um, interestingly, about a quarter of women, and this is pre predominantly women, report, I don't have an account because I use somebody else's. This is indirect access and use of accounts, um, which again, um, there's increasing evidence that ownership over assets is very much related to women's empowerment and important for uh, family dynamics. Um, and next, uh, we also find important reasons being given is that the bank is too far away. Um, I don't have the necessary documentation. Um, that's an interesting point. The FATF, the um, action, Financial Action Task Force, recently came out with a statement that documentation should not be prevent financial inclusion. And in fact, many countries have introduced exemptions um, of documentation requirements on very small accounts that we do find seems to have an impact on financial inclusion. Um, and then we have lack of trust. This is the most common reason given in um, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where perhaps for good reason, people uh, have a distrust of banks after numerous uh, instances of government expro expropriations. Um, however, you know, he, this also highlights perhaps the need for financial literacy and financial education to help people understand um, both feel comfortable using financial products and available consumer protection provisions. But overall, these barriers are suggesting the need for new products, processes, technology that can help provide affordable, accessible financial services. I'm just to summarize the data for a few more minutes. Um, we also, quite importantly, ask, did you use your account? So ownership in an account is one thing. Are you using it, particularly for savings? Um, we find about 30% of adults in developing economies say that they've put aside or saved money in the past 12 months. About half of those savers are using formal banks. The other half are saving either in community savings group like Roska's rotating savings groups or simply under the mattress. Indeed, half of savers in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, report using these Roska's. And although their popularity, um, their, their use <laughs> speaks to their popularity, they're often raft. We hear people say they belong to four Roska's because the first three may steal their money. And again, so the question is, how can the private sector design the right products to encourage people to keep their money um, in a safe place? Um, here's just splicing the data a little differently, what I call the underbanked. These are people who have an account but only save under the mattress, which is about 12% of adults in developing economies, particularly high in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. 
um, about 40, uh, about 7 percent, I'm sorry, about 40 um, percent of account holders in Sub-Saharan Africa and 15 percent of account holders in LACT saved informally in the past year. And finally, we ask on, did you borrow in the past 12 months? And this is to make data comparable across a wide spectrum of economic development, countries of various, various um, economic development. We simply ask about new loan uh, generation. So the first caveat is that we exclude credit card debt. About half of adults in high income economies report having a credit card, which we just can't disentangle whether that's being used for transactional versus credit purposes. Excluding credit card debt, um, we finally about, and we finally about 7% of adults in developing economies have a credit card, and that number is skewed. It's actually close to zero in many developing economies. Um, we find that about 8% of adults in developing economies report uh, using uh, credit in the past 12 months. However, the vast majority, as you can see by the blue line, is informal credit from family and friends, um, which we say is not completely free because when you're trying to save for education or to invest in your business and your brother-in-law asks you for money, you then have to loan it to him rather than um, use the money elsewhere. Um, and so uh, we also, it's also interesting that there's a very large gender gap here. Women are far less likely than men to have access to these informal networks of family and friends, which also may have impact on entrepreneurial financing. Um, we also ask a, credit, a question, why did you borrow? Um, we find only about 3% of adults in developing economies report having a mortgage compared to about a quarter of adults in high income economies. And finally, we ask a few questions on the use of insurance, which are more difficult to ask in this sort of survey, but find that about 6% of adults working in farming, fishery, or, uh, or uh, farming, forestry, or fishing have any sort of agricultural insurance. So I'll take my last few minutes just to mention the hopefully burning question of what explains these differences? And so certainly it is the case that differences in economic development, which we proxy by GDP per capita, do explain a lot of the variation. It explains about 77% of the variation on average. Um, the numbers are actually higher. However, look at the yellow piece. Among, if you look below the median of GDP per capita, among low and lo lower middle income countries, we find the relationship completely disappears. Um, only 15% of the variation is explained by GDP per capita. Um, two examples of neighboring countries, Cambodia and Bangladesh, approximately same GDP, but they have a difference in ownership, own, penetration of accounts um, between 4 and 32 percent, respectively. And so in a recent paper um, with colleagues uh, Franklin Allen, Nasa Demircha Kunt, and Soleil martinez Perea, we look more rigorously, econometrically, at what explains uh, the, use, the ownership and use of accounts for savings, what we call high-frequency usage, which is three or more transactions in a typical month. Um, and what we do is we use objective country-level measures of cost. What are the approximate costs of opening and maintaining account? What, of documentation? What are the number of documents required to open an account? Are there exemptions for small accounts? We look at measures of distance, um, bank branch penetration, ATM penetration. We look at measures of trust, which we are uh, generally, uh, we're broadly defining as various measures of consumer protection. We're also looking at various policies, excuse me, to um, expand financial inclusion, such as our bank agents permitted. Um, and overall, we do find a very significant relationship um, on, uh, between these country-level indicators of the enabling environment and the uh, use of accounts. Um, we also find these policies are perhaps uh, especially effective among the most excluded. We're finding the largest impact on the poor and on rural residents, poor as measured by the, lowest, uh, the poorest 20% of wage earners. Um, and also, as I mentioned, looking at these barriers, the self-reported barriers, we find that these barriers are also very much related to the, object the, the measurements. People are more likely to report costs being a barrier in countries that have higher costs of banking and suggest that these, relaxing these barriers may enable the expansion of financial inclusion. And so finally, um, this is the data that was mentioned earlier. Um, <laughs> You know, so what are some private sector-led initiatives? Um, certainly mobile banking is, as I mentioned, this way of providing this affordable, accessible banking services, particularly to the rural poor. And so outside of sub-Saharan Africa, it's not really, it's not much of a story yet. We find about only 5% of adults on average report around the world, I'm sorry, developing economies outside of sub-Saharan Africa reporting using any sort of mobile money technology. This is identified as people who report that in the past year, they've made any sort of payment on their mobile phone, either to a business or a sort of remittance payment or bill paying. 
Um, we find that 16% of adults in sub Saharan Africa report using their mobile phone to pay a bill, send or receive, or send or receive money. The great success story on the continent is Kenya, where about 70% of adults report using M-Pesa. However, I think the next bullet is critically important. At this point, less than half of adults using M-Pesa report having a bank account. And so in other words, right now, mobile technology is a substitute for, financial, for the use of the formal banking sector. And so certainly, I think a goal going forward is how do you move these people now using the mobile technology, move them into the formal banking sector, where they can benefit from other savings and payments, building credit history, have credit, et cetera. And so um, <clears throat> very excitingly, we'll be collecting the next, uh, so first of all, all the raw data, yes, all 150,000 ob observations are available on our website. We encourage you to use the data yourself, get your hands dirty with the data. Um, we also have a series of notes, regional notes, notes on housing, fragile states, gender, post offices, et cetera, um, a number of research reports. Um, this paper is now forthcoming in the Brookings papers, and so we encourage you to use the data. Um, we'll be updating the data, collecting a second round of data in 2014, and adding on a second module specifically on payments, looking at how people make um, payments to other people, how they make payments to, uh, to pay bills, how they receive their wages and government transfers, plus a few additional questions on financial capability. Um, so thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Laura. I think that uh, we should go through the other two uh, uh, speakers, and then we'll open up for yeah, questions. I, I have to leave. Are I, you leaving? I'm very sorry. Okay, so do you have Take, a couple of questions? Minutes? Please. Yeah. So uh, since thank Laura you. will be uh, uh, leaving, uh, I, we can entertain two or three questions. Yes. Mike. Uh, what do you, how important is the role of, of, of banking and electronic transactions in, in reducing fraud and bribes? I know that's been reported as a big advantage of some of the things they did in the West Bank. I'm wondering in Africa whether, whether that's, uh, do you feel that is a big uh, benefit to, to, to higher penetration? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Um, it's interesting you mention that. So um, it's almost like the better than cash alliance, which is promoting uh, electronic government payments as a way of expanding financial inclusion. That, that is their goal. However, clearly it's also to reduce corruption and transparency. Um, in fact, I was at a G20 meeting in October where um, Deputy Governor of a Central Bank in East Africa said to us, you know, when we raised this with our senior management, they told us it will never happen because the senior management at the central bank never wants any transparency of their wage payments, right? Um, in addition, um, so for example, I'm doing some work in northern Ghana, where to our surprise, where the government now pays all wage payments. This is mostly teachers, other government workers, electronically to a bank. Um, they told us the number one benefit was they now paid on time, that there are regularly strikes, there are floods, that sadly, these p government and workers are taking out these very expensive payday loans because the government's paying their wages two to three weeks late. And so um, there are tremendous benefits to these electronic payments, both transparency, but also um, the ability to be paid on time, and just the, tra and, and, you know, the overall transparency on payment dates as well um, as informal payments. Um, one more question. So I have just one question for you. Please. Please. So um, I know that there is initiative in Kenya uh, in terms of integrating mobile technology into a form of banking. You know, equity bank is really the, uh, mm -hmm. the major player. Have you seen other banks, other initiatives uh, in sub-Saharan Africa? It's a good question. So I'll start yeah. off with some numbers. Um, South Sudan, for example, yeah. over half of adults tell us that they make payments by mobile phone. So we look at the data, less than a quarter of those people report having a cell phone, and there is no mobile money provider. So we got a little nervous, we call up Gallup, you know, is your data bad? Um, and so we did focus groups. And what they told us was, one, the guy in the village with a phone is now the new local banker. Okay, so what happens is you wanna send money to your mother, to your employee living in the north, you, use some, you pay somebody to use their phone, they send money to the guy in the village with a phone, who they, I'm sorry, they send minutes, they transfer, minutes to the, the guy in the village with a phone who then cashes out those minutes and takes a small commission. Okay? This is completely informal. We have no data on these volumes going on. And so people are very creative. 
Okay? I, currently, most of the like, mobile payments in Africa is a transfer of minutes. Yeah. In the next round of the survey, we're actually will be explicitly asking, how do you transfer money? Is it linked to a bank, which we know is a very small percentage? Money stored on your phone, which at least there's an electronic track record of, or using somebody else's paying through somebody else's phone, which seems to be a very large percentage. Um, I guess the, the short answer being, part of the reason that it succeeded in Kenya and hasn't elsewhere, um, um, so in very short, one of the challenges we hear from banks is that when they make an electronic payment, they have to pay the bank fee, the, the, the mobile phone fees. So for example, they have to pay the cost of sending the SMS, whereas for the phone company, that's all free, and they can't compete yet on that cost. And so it requires innovation, it'll require more partnerships between banks and mobile phone companies to financially make it work. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Um, so it's a great question. So IPA and other randomists are out there are doing a lot of work on this topic. So specifically trying to, for example, providing mobile phones to the head of these Roscas. So when they receive their money at the weekly meetings, they can then make electronic deposit into accounts and the such. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly the hope is that going forward, technology will allow the formalization of many of these riskier informal um, well, taking, being able to maintain the cultural benefits of these community savings groups, but formalizing where the money is deposited and kept. Just, uh, just one final. Um, you mentioned about policies for uh, financial inclusion. Can you just mention like a couple of like, that you regard are really effective policies, uh, maybe based on your the work done by the bank? Sure. So one being yeah. um, bank yeah. agents. Okay, so for example, in India, they allow, and it's interesting, so simply allowing a non-bank employee to collect money on behalf of the bank, they, they work on commission, opened up, you know, so you have these images throughout Africa as well of guys on a moped going around collecting the money on behalf of the bank. So that was, that's a major legislative, uh, requires legislative change to allow. So allowing bank agents we find to be um, significantly important. Second, relaxing documentation requirements. As I mentioned, um, FATF is now, uh, there had been a tremendous backlash uh, over the past many years in terms of, you know, the, the head of Kenya Post, for example, is telling us a story that they require their average account is approximately $6, and they're required again to call every customer to come in and sign documentation forms. And he said every other customer on the phone said, listen, here's my M-Pesa number, just transfer my money to my M-Pesa account. And so now, um, so a number of countries have introduced uh, reforms allowing relaxed documentation requirements on very small rural, rural accounts. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank okay. you. So, Thank okay. you so much. Um, so as you all know now, uh, Global Bank has really been increasing uh, over the last decades or so, but of course we have had a setback in the last uh, few years after the crisis. Uh, so there's been a little bit of a contraction there and a little bit more of a balkanization where it's not so much global banks, but rather local subsidiary uh, model that has been prevailing. Um, but nevertheless, it raises the questions, what are the benefits and risks of these, these global banks? Uh, should we really keep encouraging them, or actually are uh, they not necessarily good? Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is give you the, both sides. There's benefits, capital is better allocated. I think you're going to get efficiency gains from introducing technology, from having more uh, foreign know-how being introduced. But there are risks at times in which sometimes these banks operate by, in some sense, increasing the cycle that's going on within the country, the importing risk from abroad in that way. Uh, and as a consequence, you have to be careful when you look at foreign banking. Um, let me start off with, with some descriptions on the foreign banking presence to begin with. Uh, <clears throat> there's been a slow increase, but it has been often uh, accelerated by f reforms. So in Eastern Europe, we have had a lot of increase following the transition there, in Asia after the crisis. And over time, we have now seen, on average, about a 30% or 35% share in terms of both numbers as well as asset share in emerging markets. Um, but that, that really masks a lot of differences because it is, it is quite varying around the world. Um, in general, it was low. This is kind of a, a heat map around the world in terms of low coloring. It's less uh, prevalent in 95. And if you take a situation like 2009, which is kind of before or in the middle of the crisis, we see that many of these countries have now become darker, 
that have been increasing Eastern Europe and Africa importantly uh, as big components of that, but also Latin America and to some degree in, in Asia. The strongest trend clearly was in emerging markets developing countries. Uh, if you look at advanced countries, it went up maybe from 20% uh, percent by a few percentage points, but in emerging markets almost doubled and emerged in developing countries uh, as well. So we've seen a strong increase in foreign banks in terms of operating in these markets. Um, Having said that, there are differences. Um, so it's not a universal pattern here. Um, if I rank here on the left part, part of the panel, what you see is in terms of the number of banks, foreign banks in various markets, and you go down to the top 10, you have some banks, some markets where foreign banks are like 90 or 100 percent of the market. So, so if you take Mexico, if you take uh, uh, Hungary, if you take Slo Slo Slovakia, uh, they're very important there. If you go towards advanced countries, that's not necessarily the case. There they tend to be a little bit more niche plays, a little bit smaller. You see that even more if you go to the right side of the panel, where you see the market share in terms of the number of assets. Um, so in some markets, they dominate, they take up the whole market. But in many other countries, particularly, again, in advanced countries, we've got a lot of niche players, a lot of foreign banks operating there to do some transactions for multinationals, um, uh, but not necessarily for the locals. Um. There's also, of course, but that's more obvious, a big concentration where they come from. It's still the larger advanced countries that tend to export foreign banking. So you have to think of the US, you have to think of the UK. They're very big in terms of uh, foreign banking. Um, but there is this strong regional pattern. If, if you take this matrix where you go by regions, the Americas, Asia, Europe, uh, and Middle East and Africa, and you do the, the columns accordingly, you see that the diagonal has the, the largest representation. So there's a lot of intra-regional banking. And in, importantly, among the Middle East, importantly among Asia, the kind of emerging market banks are starting to expand, and this is a trend has been increasing over the period that we cover, um, in terms of, of being there. So it's some, in some regions, it's like 70% are within the region foreign banking. And that's important because it's, it's reflecting the strengths of these uh, emerging market banks as they have evolved. And then the question in terms of, okay, how should we look at these foreign banks, at these global banks more generally? Are they good or are they bad? Uh, so this is where some of the research I'll, I'll talk about have, has focused on. And I think what people often tend to forget is that foreign banks are different from domestic banks. Uh, it's not that foreign banks are going to do exactly the same as the domestic banks will do. They have a different niche, they have a different comparative advantage, there, there's competition. So they're, they're different, and you can see that in terms of the balance sheet, I'll give you quickly some numbers, um, that they are different from the domestic banks. So we shouldn't necessarily think that they're going to be exactly the same or add the same kind of services. Um, um, having said that, the foreign banks are an important competitive force for the local banks, so they do have to shape up. And what you often see is that the foreign bank come in and they force the, the domestic banks to go down market, to go down the SMEs or maybe more access for the low income level people. And in that way, they really help overall build a, a financial system the way uh, it should be. Um, they increase access and increase performance of borrowers, and there's lots of evidence for that. Important question, and I will focus a lot on that, is the financial stability question. Obviously, with the financial crisis, we've had many questions, are, are these foreign banks bad or adding to the instability that we have seen? And I'll give you some evidence that it's, it's a mixed picture. There is some risk, but there's also some benefits. So, so we don't have much time. The slides will be available later. Just to tell you that these foreign banks do differ in terms of balance sheets. They tend to be stronger on, on liquidity, on capital, but they also tend to lend less relative to deposits. So they're more conservative in general in the balance sheet operations. Important to keep in mind when we think of these foreign banks. If you then ask yourselves, okay, <clears throat> now, are these foreign banks in some sense more profitable? Do they have the advantage and as a consequence are able to function better in these emerging markets? Again, here there's a mixed picture. So yes, they have the technology and the skill that I mentioned to you before. At the same time, they often have a difficulty operating in these somewhat uh, harsher environments. Uh, so the laws are not necessarily as, as good, the information is not necessarily as good. And as a consequence, you as a foreign bank that may come in with all the technology that you want, you can't do a credit score uh, kind of lending in some of these environments, that's obvious. Uh, but you don't even have credit information on a large borrower often. So as a consequence, the performance of these foreign banks is not necessarily always better than the local banks. Um, this is a chart that kind of shows you that 
and again, you will, can look at it later, if you ask where the foreign banks are more profitable than the domestic banks, um, it's that they, in some sense, exploit these inefficiencies uh, that Ian uh, also mentioned beforehand that exist still in these markets. Um, so that they tend to be more profitable in developing countries, but have a harder time being profitable in advanced countries. That makes a lot of sense. As a foreign bank coming into the US, it's hard to make profit relative to the local guys. Um, they also, interesting, make less profit when there are a lot of foreign banks there, meaning that when they are all there together, they compete so much among each other that they not necessarily have a profit benefit uh, uh, to begin with. Moving on, question on the spillovers. Spillovers is a big research policy topic, obviously. Uh, is a foreign direct investor, investor in China just exploiting, quote unquote, the low labor cost, or actually is it adding know-how through human capital, through technology, to the rest of the system? And here, I think, actually, on the foreign banking, it is a little bit more balanced picture than we often see in the FDI. The FDI side, people have been debating this for a while, but don't tend to find too much spillovers, if I interpret the research correctly. Um, here on the foreign bank, and I think we have seen that, um, but there are some conditions that need to be in place for us to be able to, to be, feel comfortable about it. I'm giving you here some better local environment. Uh, uh, there has to be a threshold. A certain number of banks is important. Uh, the larger you are, the better you are, the healthier you are. Um, but the overall, I would say, foreign banks can add uh, to the domestic financial system in, in many dimensions, in many ways. Um, now the stability question. Um, well, two always two flip sides to it, before and after the crisis, so to speak. Um, so before the crisis, there was this worry that these foreign banks' capital flows add to domestic uh, emerging market booms. This chart shows you, indeed, that is correct. A lot of capital inflows, a lot of more credit booms, which unfortunately often became credit busts afterwards. So yes, their international integration wasn't always the most helpful. Now, how much did the foreign banks contribute to that? Well, that's actually not so much. Um, if you asked how large were these banks in the markets, the numbers I gave you before, and how much was their capital inflow cross the border, then the, the ratio is quite weak. This re regression line is, is almost flat. Um, so it's not that it, when you had local banks, foreign banks operating in your market, you suddenly have more capital inflow. Actually, probably the argument is, is somewhat reversed, that the local banks were a more stable source of funding within the market and made it less likely that you needed to go abroad to attract your funding because you developed it locally. In that sense, um, the foreign banks didn't necessarily increase the boom before the crisis. The question afterwards is a little bit more mixed, and this is always where we have the, the, the risk sharing that people tend to forget when we have a global financial system, we're sharing risk among each other, that sometimes when you're gonna be benefiting from it, and sometimes when you're gonna be hurting from it. You pay insurance, you, you pay it over the years, and sometimes you, you have a loss, and then you get the benefit from it. And the same thing here, the risk sharing before the crisis was very good, um, even in 08, 09, many countries in Eastern Europe, particularly emerging markets, benefited a great deal from having foreign banks from Europe, from the US, that mitigated the, the, the bust that they were experiencing. So these foreign banks brought in capital, brought in liquidity to the Vienna Initiative, they stabilized the local system. As the foreign banks started to get hurt themselves within the US and elsewhere, it became a little bit more of a picture. Then the foreign banks started to export some of their risks to these emerging markets, um, and they started to hurt. But, and this is the second part of the, of the but, is there were a lot of differences here across markets. So depending on who, who the, how the foreign banks were operating within your market, you were more or less hit by this importing of the foreign US European shock into the emerging markets. Um, and again, I'll, I'll give you some, some differences here. So the foreign banks, for example, cut back credit in the countries relative to the domestic banks. This is a relative statement. And the first chart gives you 6%. The first bar is, is the cutback. But then if you start slicing the numbers by where they cut back more, you find that if they were large within the market, they didn't tend to cut back as much. If they were close to the market, they didn't tend to cut back as much or at all. Um, so it's important here to make a, a, a differentiation between how these foreign banks operated, where they were, and how they were, were, were um, managing them. Um, you can also see this in this, this chart. This chart takes you uh, two-dimensional. You have the foreign claims on, from abroad 
on the domestic banking, on the non-banks in the country. So anything that's being lent from US, what have you, into, let's say, Hungary. And they asked the question, let's correct that for what is actually being funded locally by the foreign banks. And the chart would be 45 degree line if there was no uh, difference between the two. Well, actually, often because there's a lot of local funding, we see that this line is quite, the dots are quite low, far below it. And even more so in emerging Europe and, uh, and, and emerging countries in general. Interesting enough, the advanced countries had more cross-border funding of foreign banks, but the emerging markets had a lot more local funding. That made them more stable. So when the crisis came, when there was a cutback, Yes, there was in this chart a number of countries where we saw a decrease in lending that I showed you before, but there were also quite a few that had an increase in lending. And the differentiation between the two depends a lot on the funding model. So foreign banks, again, differentiation, how do they operate, what are they trying to achieve in the market, and do they fund themselves locally or abroad is important to keep in mind. If you have one or two more minutes, what do we want to do in terms of now risk? This is really the policy question that that's institutions like the IMF and others face. How can we now reduce this, this, the cost in some sense of, of foreign banking? Uh, big issue, the, we have these global banks that are difficult to operate to begin with. We've had troubles uh, too big to fail uh, with, with any of the banks that we uh, know, city banks or, or what have you uh, around the world. So it's a choice. It's an even more complicated choice across border. Um, and the way we have been calling it is we, we call it the financial trilemma. Um, there's an economic term, economic trilemma. We call it the financial trilemma. It's hard to make a choice between uh, three things. And I'll, I'll go through what those three uh, issues are. So the problem is that you, when these large global CIFIs, they're called systemic international financial institutions, um, when they're, har they're hard to unbind. Um, they're normally not even resolved in a clean way. So if you ask, what do we do from a bank that runs into trouble in, in the US, let's say, then the FDIC takes a liquidation route most of the times, or sometimes takes a purchase and assumption route, a P&A route. But as the size of the bank gets larger, we know we're going to have to do some bailout. We, know we may even have to nationalize these, these banks. Now, of course, that is, that is a big problem. Um, it's nicely captured in this cartoon. Um, governments should never be coerced into providing a bailout because of fear of creating financial crisis. And there there's this banker writing this letter. Uh, uh, I destroyed the economy once before. Let me have my bonus, one billion bonus again, or I, otherwise I'll do it again. Um, <laughs> so you've got this too, too big to fail problem with these banks. How do we uh, deal with them? Lots of solutions, but in the international context, the problem is this trilemma. Do we want global financial stability? Do we want cross-border banks and national authorities? These three, in some sense, are inconsistent. You can't have global banks and global stability if at the same time all the rules are still nationalized. Uh, so we have to give up on some of these dimensions. Uh, and here, and I'll, I'll be very brief here, there are some approaches you can take to that. You can go territorial. We, we make everything national, not my preferred model. You can go universal. We have a new international regulator. Uh, it's not the IMF, but another international regulator that looks after these global banks. That's probably unlikely. Um, it's uh, asking too much uh, of the international uh, politicians. But it's maybe something what we call the modified universal uh, mechanism. And that's actually something what the Europeans are trying to do with the banking union. It, it's a kind of an interesting experiment. Uh, it's an experiment for the moment because we don't know yet where they will go. But they want to integrate regulation. They want to integrate resolution, mean the resolving of a bank, the post insurance and the fiscal cost, if there are any costs with it. Um, they're moving in steps. Uh, the sequence isn't always the obvious one. But it's an interesting one uh, whether that's going to work. We as an IMF are saying, yes, that's good, but there's also, you need to keep in mind, there's always three parts to the, to the puzzle. You need to prevent the crisis, to prevent the problem of becoming too big to fail. You then need to intervene early on. You need to be ready there. And then you need to resolve in an early way. Um, there are elements being developed on each of these um, the things, but the, not the whole picture isn't there yet. Um, and that's why we have put forward something called the key attributes of effective resolution regimes. It's kind of a new global standard 
where countries can buy into and saying, listen, I adhere to these rules for both intervening and resolving financial institutions. And if enough countries sign on to it, we can all feel com more comfortable that the system as a whole will actually start to work. Um, it's early days. We're still kind of test casing this, uh, so to speak, um, but hopefully that will go. To summarize, global banking, there's always two sides of it. It's a risk-sharing story. Don't look at the bad side today and the good side tomorrow. We have to be realistic. Um, a lot of the varies by the heterogeneity of the banks. The banks vary uh, quite a bit uh, in, by themselves, but also within the market they operate. Um, and then secondly, on the policy side, we need to move to a more uh, better uh, institutional structure so that we can actually deal with these banks when they become too big uh, to fail otherwise. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stein. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're running behind, but I think we're going to borrow some time from the break. And we'll probably start uh, the next session a little bit, um, uh, maybe 10 minutes uh, uh, later. So I think, I think it's useful to have some uh, questions and, and comments from the audience. Uh, please announce yourself and or maybe also your affiliation. Hi, uh, my name is Mary. I am working for Inter-American Investment Corporation, which is a part of the private sector division in the Inter-American Development Bank. So I have a question for Professor Alayala, Alayanis. Yeah, very good yeah. And yeah. so last year we did a big syndication from Japanese banks to Brazilian banks. And I guess there was a huge like cash inflow from like the developed world to, to like the, the emerging markets. So what was like say in terms of the creditors, what is like the biggest risk of the, this uh, huge cash inflow? and then the, the growth slowdown in this year, and then the, if the bubble blast, when do you think it's going to be? <laughs> <laughs> it's like the lesson number one that you don't do is you never say the stock market is high or low. Huh? Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's all very hard to say, right? Um, so I don't know the specific. And, uh, all, all I wanted to say is that uh, the fact that you see a lot more uh, EM to EM flows it does not mean that uh, we, we, you know, the flows from the developed markets have stopped towards emerging. In fact, there is, uh, um, I, th I guess my main point was there's a rethinking of that strategy as to what makes sense and what's rational. Um, is Brazil in bubble? I don't think so, but is, a, is it, uh, you know, so if there's no bubble, there's no bursting. But uh, I will stop here. All I said is that uh, hopefully the Olympics will give them some boost. The, the problem I saw in another country, which I'm very familiar with, is that uh, uh, easy access to credit, which is something that Stein also touched upon, could, uh, uh, it's, it's easy. If somebody gives you a credit card with 0% interest rates and you never have to pay anything, uh, you're going to spend. And then when they come back for the money and you don't have, that's a problem. So uh, the country that is familiar with is Greece is from Greece. Okay. So the next question. Uh, go ahead. Uh, my name is Ashay Doshi, and I'm an undergraduate finance major. First of all, thanks a lot for talking to us today. And my question is about the BRICS country that you alluded to earlier. Um, the recent developments are that there's a BRICS development bank coming up, hmm. which is in talks, and there's like $100 billion as of now hmm. in terms of reserves to fund projects in terms of infrastructure. Hmm. So my question is in terms of uh, international banking and regional banking, how is that going to affect hmm. policy regulation hmm. and balance of powers between the countries? And, and I, I, I'm call, calling Stein here. He's oh, probably, Stein he is probably yeah. the yeah. expert on yeah. this. Uh, you know, is it a threat to the IMF? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think what we have seen is there's so much reserves build up in emerging markets, in part because in, in some sense international financial architecture isn't perfect enough, so the countries are worried about these capital inflows um, that for the moment are often driven by low interest rates uh, in the U.S. and other advanced countries. So as a consequence, they should be conservative, but the reserves are idle, or at least they're being invested in U.S. treasuries and the like. And I think from a development perspective, that's not necessarily the best thing. So these new initiatives of kind of using the funds more productively, some of them have taken the form of summer wealth funds. Um, that's more on the 
real investing side, but I think uh, issues like an infrastructure-oriented bank would be very useful. Um, and don't forget, there's already a lot happening like that in emerging markets. BNDES is a big uh, Brazilian uh, development bank that probably lends three times as much on an annual basis as the World Bank does, and this is only in Brazil. So um, there's a lot of intra uh, in, and inter emerging market lending for infrastructure, but this, the amounts are huge. Uh, people come up with four or five trillion in the next four or five years uh, that needs to be financed in some form. So I think the BRICS Bank is a very good example of how th that can, can be uh, done productively. Okay, one more question. Yeah, please. What? I guess there are two questions. About that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm a student from Johns Hopkins University. You alluded earlier to the fact that Africa is emerging markets now and uh, wasn't much mentioned in the presentations, but I wanted to ask you um, your observations of the, um, f the perception of uh, foreign direct investment risks into these economies and into these uh, banking systems. Recently, I heard fresh off the press, but very quiet rumoring that one man single-handedly has um, been able to fraud one West African nation bank and has single-handedly crippled the system. It may or may not be true, but um, these kind of things are the things that people see as risk when we talk about foreign direct investment. So if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. And I, I have uh, less uh, experience with, uh, with Africa, but uh, um, since I grew up in a country that actually is the closest to Africa, although it's a European one, uh, I think I would say that uh, the biggest issue, not just in Africa, but I, I think uh, surprisingly for many of us uh, in Europe as well, is, is the issue of corruption. And so uh, the, the key thing would be um, how, what kinds of institutions we are setting and what kinds of measures are we taking uh, with the help, of course, of, uh, of uh, international organizations that would limit that. Uh, to me, I think uh, that that is a major issue, and I'm not saying anything very different than many people have said before me. Um, the surprise part is that you think you, you develop, uh, you think you are on the right path, and then um, and then there's a setback. So I think risks are always, I mean, who would have thought that actually investing in a European Union country is a, is a high risk? And uh, yet we see that. And we see a lot of, so, so if that's an issue, um, obviously investing in Africa is, is a huge issue. Having said that, I think there is a, this tremendous uh, movement and heterogeneity among African nations. So I was uh, recently in South Africa and Zambia, actually, which is fascinating. Uh, and uh, the economies, I think, s seem to be moving uh, very quickly in very different directions. So, you know, an economy that used to be a basket case, now all of a sudden it's the next hot thing, and vice versa. And uh, uh, I think part of it has to do with uh, the demands uh, of, uh, you know, literally China and others were growing for uh, raw material and... Uh, uh, commodities and uh, so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a mixture. But I think the overarching theme, uh, just to end, is uh, if we if we manage to fight uh, corruption that you mentioned everywhere, we're all going to be better off. So maybe I should uh, weigh in also. Um, I think your your question kind of implies that Africa is just one country. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I know that you didn't mean that. Okay. But I think there's a tendency. Uh, on the part of people outside Africa to think of the continent as if like one troubled country, okay? And I wanted to emphasize the heterogeneity. Uh, there's a lot of cross-sectional variation. The genuinely reforming countries are growing. And this, is, this was not accidental because the, the entire region has actually undergone extensive economic and financial sector reforms and, 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 and empowerment of private initiative and also a larger scale privatization and market orientation technology and greater integration in the global economy. And, and some of you may, may already know that seven of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are now in Africa. Okay, so, so really when you start talking about risk, it's really important that you actually differentiate those because um, in the past it used to be that, especially the media, they tend to lump the genuinely reforming countries with the ungenuine guys and the genuine guys actually suffer from this information gap. In economics, we call that the pooling equilibrium. And that is actually, actually uh, declining as well. 
So, um, so I wanted to say, in fact, I did actually some uh, finance-based risk-adjusted metrics on uh, African stock markets. And you know that there are actually stock markets in Africa. There are 28 of them. There were only five some 10, 15 years ago. And actually, they tend to actually look pretty good relative to the other peer emerging uh, countries. So, so this, the issue that you raised could happen in this country, could happen anywhere, but people need to do due diligence and focus on those which are actually generally reforming. Okay, one more question and then, then we'll proceed. Yes, please. Hi, Andrew Xiao, I'm an MBA student in the Maryland. Uh, my question is about China's shadow banking system. Mm -hmm. From what I've read, I think it's almost as large as the kind of regular banking system, but it has a lot more bad loans. It uh, is, I think, sponsored on more of a prov province level or village and town level, and they're more interested in jobs and whatnot th and you know, creating businesses than they are in some kind of macro level overheating. Do you see that as a big threat? No, and, and maybe Stan w wants to add something. Uh, one thing I, I, that has been actually in the news a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the positive thing about uh, China, of course, is uh, um, they have uh, huge reserves. So uh, I would think that they could bail out some banks. But uh, it's uh, it, it definitely not something that is, uh, whenever you have a, dis a divergence from uh, uh, economics, and so lending not for the right reasons, I think you could have a problem. But I don't know if Ken yeah, yeah, wants to add. Ch China is still in the early days of its financial reforms, uh, uh, including on its liberalization of interest rates and more generally market entry of different uh, organizations. And on the foreign banking, it would be very low uh, because it doesn't allow that as easily as other countries. Uh, as a consequence, you have seen some other forms of intermediation because there's still a lot of demand, among the, particularly among the non-state enterprise, for access to finance. The state enterprise will get it from the commercial banks that are largely state-owned. And that shadow banking is a reaction to that. And, and on the whole, I would say a positive one because it's catering to the demands among these SMEs, among these private enterprises to grow. Um, does it lead to something that's sometimes shadowy? Um, there's, there's always a difference between shadow banking and shadowy banking. Shadowy banking, I call, if you're trying to avoid some regulations, if you're trying to avoid uh, some, some criminal, for criminal reasons, etc. Of course, that's, we don't want that. Uh, but to the extent this is a healthy development of intermediating in a productive way, through non-bank financing something. We have leasing companies here, we have factoring companies here, we can do other, lots of different types of financing that doesn't have to go through the banking system. So I don't think we necessarily need to look at it as something bad. We need to understand it better, and sometimes we need to regulate it. Okay, I think we're going to conclude. I just wanted to make one uh, statement, it's not a question, on, on this issue of foreign banks and maybe on the, on the, on the dark side. Uh, uh, you mentioned about financial stability. So one thing that I noticed in Kenya, there was a big issue of financial inclusion. Because I, I, what I saw was this hierarchy of, of banks. The, the domestic private is actually doing very well when it comes to access to finance. And then, then you have government bonds, and then when it, government banks. And then the foreign banks tend to be uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the very bottom of that ladder. And I was just wondering if you guys are actually looking beyond financial stability into financial inclusion role of foreign banks as well. And, and, and this is like one country incident that I saw. Less so, uh, inclusion yeah. been yeah. less investigated, yeah. but, but yeah. more access yeah. for SMEs, et cetera. There the record is, is fairly positive. But yeah. you have to have large enough footprint in order to make it happen. Mm. So it cannot be your, your headquarter domestic capital foreign mm. bank that gives to services to a few multinationals and privileged people. And mm. I think that's where you either go all the way or you, you kind of take a different model. Okay, with this, we are going to conclude this uh, exciting session. And, uh